All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. And this lesson is going to be the first lesson in a series of lessons in which we are going to talk about heart failure. And in particular, in this lesson, we're going to go over all of the basics of what exactly heart failure is. And so we're going to break this down fully and really give you guys some good information on what exactly is happening with your patients when they do have heart failure. But before we begin, if this is your first time to this channel and you'd really be interested in more in-depth critical care education content such as this video, then please do subscribe to our channel below. Make sure though you hit that notification bell, that way you'll be notified as soon as our new lessons become available to you guys. And I really do value your subscriptions, the likes, the comments that you guys leave. They really go a long way in helping to support this channel here. And for that, I do want to thank you guys. And my name is Eddie Watson, and I'm going to be presenting this lesson for you. So like I said, this is going to be the first part in a series of lessons that we're doing covering heart failure. It's really important that you guys have a good understanding of what's happening with your patients when they have heart failure, because this is something that you guys are going to see all the time. And particularly, a lot of the management of heart failure when it progresses to a certain point will only be possible in an ICU environment. We will eventually get to that information in a later lesson and kind of talk about some of that management and treatment that we do, but these are going to be patients that you are going to be taking care of. And needless to say, as things progress to more advanced stages of heart failure, your patients can end up pretty sick as a result when their heart is not really functioning like it should be. And so to start out, what we're going to do is really give you guys a good overview of what exactly heart failure is. And to do that, I really want to start with a quick overview of what the responsibility of our heart is to do. And essentially, the main job of our heart is to move blood throughout our body. And so to do a quick recap of this process, we have deoxygenated blood that's coming from our body, and it's going to be entering in through these two veins into the right side of our heart over here. That blood's going to move through out into the pulmonary arteries, at which point it's going to be carried to the lungs in order to be oxygenated. Once that blood is oxygenated, it's going to move back in through the pulmonary veins into the left side of our heart. It's going to go through here and out through the aorta and ultimately on to the rest of the body. I know it's a bit of a review, but it's important to know that the right side of the heart is going to the lungs to oxygenate and the left side of the heart is distributing that blood to the rest of the body. And obviously this is oxygenated blood at this point. And so like I said, the heart's job is to move this blood throughout our body, throughout this system. And as we're going to talk about here in a bit, heart failure is essentially when this is not happening the way it's supposed to. The heart is not able to pump and get this blood throughout our system like it's supposed to. Really before we begin though, I do want to go over some quick facts regarding heart failure. And heart failure is one of the most common conditions that we find, especially in our elderly population. And in fact, to really drive this point home, we estimate that probably more than 5 million people are living with heart failure. And every year we're diagnosing another 550,000 people with heart failure. And of all these people living with heart failure, we see about 287,000 people die each year. So, I mean, this is just an astronomical amount of people that are ultimately dying as a result of this condition. When we look at people's hospital stay, this is the most common diagnosis in patients who are over 65. We do find equal rates between men and women. Although we do see in African Americans that they have about 1.5 times more likely of a chance of developing heart failure. So like I said, truly a big problem. It's definitely something you guys are going to come across in your practice and it's important that you know what's going on. So like I had mentioned earlier, essentially heart failure in a general term is something that describes impaired cardiac function. And this impaired function can happen on the left side, the right side, or in fact it can even happen in both chambers. And this is something that we call biventricular failure. And so essentially what's going on is we have the heart and it's not able to meet the metabolic demands that's going on in our body. And so if we think about it, our body has our oxygen demands that it requires. And these demands will go up or down depending on what we're doing, activity or other things like that. And normally what will happen is we'll get our heart to compensate. So it's going to attempt to accommodate to these changes and demands that our body's requiring. 
So in order to understand how our heart meets this change in demand, we have to think about the cardiac output equation. And I actually have a really good video that I've done on this already, which I'm going to link to in the cards up above as well as down in the notes below. But as a quick recap, we know that our cardiac output is equal to our heart rate times our stroke volume. So if we want to increase our cardiac output, we have to increase either our heart rate or our stroke volume or possibly even both. And so our heart will do that in an attempt to compensate for this increase in demand. But like we just talked about in heart failure, the heart's not able to meet these demands. And the reason for this is because in heart failure, we have this decreased stroke volume that's just a byproduct of the failing heart. And so as a result, we don't have that ability to really increase our cardiac output in response to our body's needs. And so in order to understand why this is, we're going to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of heart failure. And this pathophysiology that we see resulting in heart failure in our patients is really the result of two primary dysfunctions, although we can have a combination of both. The first of these is what we call systolic heart failure. And so as we know, if we look at our normal heart here in the middle, normally we have a very forceful and strong contraction that takes place. And this is able to pump that blood throughout the body. But what happens when we have systolic heart failure is the heart loses that ability to pump effectively. It ends up with decreased strength and therefore it cannot eject enough blood with enough force to get it throughout our body effectively. And the reason it's unable to do this is because we end up with weakened and smaller muscles with these enlarged chambers. So if you take a look at our muscle wall here compared to the muscle wall on our healthy heart, you can see that it's much thinner. But at the same time, this space in the chamber has expanded out. So you end up with this big chamber with this weak heart and it's just not able to pump. It's harder for the heart to be able to squeeze and eject that blood out. While at the same time, it also has more blood in there and so in fact, in the next lesson in this series, I'm going to do a good breakdown on the difference between our systolic and diastolic heart failure. But for now, this is the, the basics that I want you guys to know in order to understand some of the differences that are happening. But essentially, you guys can think of our problem with systolic heart failure as being a problem with contraction. And so now the other type of dysfunction that you're going to see is something that we call diastolic heart failure. And if you think about diastole is that time in which our heart is filling with blood in between each contraction. And so you can really think of this as a problem with filling. And essentially what that means is we end up with these larger heart muscles. So as you can see, if you compare this to not only our normal heart, but our systolic heart failure, you can see that these muscles are much bigger. And since they're so much bigger, they end up taking up more space and this causes the ventricles to decrease in size in order to accommodate for that larger heart muscle. And so what's going to happen is our heart's not going to fill up with enough blood. And so even if we have a strong contraction, we're just really not going to be able to eject a lot of blood out of here, again manifesting itself in a state of heart failure. Now like I just mentioned a little bit ago, you can have heart failure that affects the left side of our heart, or you can have heart failure that affects the right side of the heart. Or you can also have both sides of the heart that fail, and this is what we call our biventricular. Now usually the heart failure will begin on the left, and it then can progress to right-sided failure. But this can happen the other way around, and you can start with right-sided failure, and then that can progress to biventricular failure. And it's important to know that you can have both a systolic or a diastolic failure that's happening on either the left or the right side, and you can even sometimes have a combination of both. And really the symptoms that you're going to see in your patient are going to depend on what type of failure they have, which side of the heart it is that's failing, and those will manifest themselves in different symptoms, again, which we will talk about in a later lesson here. So like I said, this is a quick rundown to give you guys an overview of this pathophysiology and so that you understand what these two dysfunctions are that you're going to see in your patient, as well as how they're going to manifest themselves. But we will talk in much more detail about this in a little bit. Now next, I do want to talk about some of our causes for heart failure. And an important thing to know is this is usually a secondary condition. And what I mean by that is it's typically going to be caused by some sort of other underlying disease process that has already impacted our patient's cardiac output. 
And again, we will talk about these causes more in depth in these future lessons. But the main takeaway I want you guys to know is that the heart failure is a manifestation of this damage that has already been done to our cardiac muscles. These causes, though, they can be the result of either lifestyle choices or even underlying disease processes. But over time, ultimately, these result in the death of cardiac muscle. And by having this muscle die off, the heart loses its ability to pump blood effectively. So as these cells die, the heart will become weaker. And like we talked about, when we lose that cardiac output, the heart is going to attempt to compensate. Again, either increasing our heart rate or increasing our stroke volume. And in fact, we are going to talk about this compensation that's going on here a little bit further in just a minute. But in the early stages of heart failure for our patients, these compensation mechanisms are able to make up for this lost pumping ability. And as a result, you're not going to really see any symptoms or problems manifesting. And so over time, we're going to see these cells, they become overworked. And as a result, they're going to need more oxygen. But since we have a problem with our oxygen supply and heart failure, they're not going to get the oxygen that they need. And once again, they begin to die off. And so again, this causes a decrease in our stroke volume and makes the heart failure worse. And so you can really see that as we go through this, this is a cyclical progression of this disease. And so like I said, I do want to talk further about this compensation process here. And like we said, our decreased cardiac output is what's going to lead us to this compensation mechanism. And so when we look at this compensation, there's really three types that we're going to see. The first is going to be from our sympathetic nervous system. And so by activating this system, we're going to see a couple things. We're going to see an increase in our heart rate, and we're going to see an increase in our force of contraction. And both of these are going to come as a result of activation of the beta receptors in our heart. But what happens over time, if we continue to activate this sympathetic response, is we're going to end up with downregulation of these receptor sites. And as a result, this is going to lead to a decreased response. And so what happens is, if we continue to activate the sympathetic response, is these beta receptor sites are going to downregulate and they're going to decrease in the number that there are. And therefore, when we go to activate them again, there's not going to be as many and we're not going to see as much of a response. Now, the second type of compensation that we're going to see is by increasing our preload. And so really, we can think about this as increasing the volume of blood that's going to be available in the ventricle before contraction. This is what we call our preload. By doing this, we're going to end up with an increase in the stretch. And as a result, we're going to end up with a more forceful contraction. So again, if you think about the Frank Starling law, if we increase the filling of those ventricles, they're going to stretch out more and you're going to end up with a more forceful contraction as a result. And so really one of the best analogies for this is if we think about a rubber band. So I'm sure we all know that if we stretch that rubber band out a little bit, it's going to snap back. But then if we stretch that rubber band out even more, it's going to snap back even more forceful. And this is essentially the basic principle behind the Frank Starling Law. Now the way our body is going to increase this volume of blood is going to be through the use of specific hormones. And in particular, we're going to be looking at our antidiuretic hormone, or our ADH, as well as our aldosterone. Antidiuretic hormone, I think, is pretty self-explanatory, but the aldosterone is really part of that renin, angiotensin, aldosterone pathway that we have in our body. Again, I'm going to link in a card up above as well as down in the notes. A really great lesson that I did on this, uh, talking about this system within the series on shock. But the important thing to know is that both of these hormones are going to stimulate our body to retain fluid. And by retaining this fluid, we're going to increase our blood volume. But unfortunately for our patient with heart failure, this increased contraction that we're going to get is going to mean more oxygen demand, therefore more blood that's needed, and once again, 
we're dealing with a patient who has decreased blood supply. We're not able to meet the demand. And so once again, looking back at that cycle that we go through, muscle cells are going to die off and we're going to further progress our state of heart failure. Now, finally, the third type of compensation mechanism that we're going to see is going to be what we call myocardial hypertrophy. And essentially what this means is we're going to see both a growth in the size as well as the amount of muscle cells within the heart. So we're going to increase the number of muscle cells that are there, but we're also going to increase the size of the muscle cells that are still left. And this is going to be an attempt to make up for those that have died off. But once again, back to that cycle of heart failure, this then means that we're going to need more oxygen, therefore more blood supply, but we're not able to get that. So once again, more cells are going to die off and we're going to continue in that cyclical progression. In addition to this, because we have more volume of muscle cell going on, this can lead to the diastolic heart failure that we talked about in which we end up with the decreased chamber size and less room to fill. And so really all these points that I keep going back to are going to take us to one last thing that I want to talk about, and that's what we call decompensation. And so what happens is we have this overuse of compensation mechanisms, and this can lead to those negative re results that we were just talking about. And this is what we call decompensation. So while these compensation mechanisms are intended to do our body good, in the long run in our patient with heart failure, we're actually going to progress and worsen the symptoms of heart failure. And in fact, these compensation mechanisms, by worsening the symptoms of heart failure, they ultimately will lead to this state of decompensation. And really, these compensation mechanisms, they also feed into each other. And so as an example, if we have this myocardial hypertrophy going on, this could lead to an activation of our sympathetic nervous system, which ultimately will continue to progress our decompensation, but the body will attempt to compensate by, let's say, increasing the preload. And so all of these work together and feed into each other, and again, can really contribute to that decompensation that we see in our patient. All right, so at this point, I'm going to stop this lesson. We did cover quite a bit in this lesson to really give you guys a good overview of what exactly is heart failure. We did a quick overview of what the heart's job is in moving that blood around the body, as well as we went over some of the stats on how often you guys are going to see this. We then moved on to kind of do a quick overview of the pathophysiology and the differences between our systolic and diastolic failure, as well as talking about the fact that we can have left-sided, right-sided, or biventricular failure. And then concluded things here talking about some of the causes, but really talking about that cycle of progression as our body begins to try to compensate, ultimately leading to worsening of our heart failure and ultimately decompensation in our patient. And so with all that said, I do want to thank you guys for watching this lesson. I really hope that you guys were able to get something out of this and have a little bit better understanding of what's going on in your patient that is having heart failure. If you did like this video or you found it useful, please do leave us a like down below as well as leave us a comment and tell us what you thought about it. In the next lesson, we're going to go deeper into talking about our differences in this pathophysiology as we talk about the differences between our systolic and our diastolic heart failure. In the meantime, though, head on over and check out our last lesson that we did in which we talked about the Glasgow Coma Scale. As always, I want to thank you guys for watching and we'll see you in the next lesson.